going to record this. The, pre the presenters today will be Dr. Jenna Jorns from the Great Lakes Integrated Sciences and Assessments, uh, GLISA, uh, which is a uh, university-based but NOAA-funded activity, and Dr. Brent Lofgren from the NOAA Great Lakes Environmental Research Lab will also be speaking during this time. Uh, you can see right there on the front of the uh, presentation the link to the entire uh, report, which Jenna, Jenna and Brent will talk more about in just a few minutes. If you have questions at any time, please, or want to communicate something at any time, please use the question uh, section of the webinar to ask your question. We'll get to all the questions at the end. And even at the end, if you want to raise your hand, there's a way to click your little hand to raise there, and I can see that <clears throat> at any point. We can take the, we can take sort of questions and comments afterwards as well. So uh, a couple different ways to ask questions. But we're going to let Jenna and Brent uh, go through their presentation, and then we'll get to the, any kind of questions people might have. And I encourage those. We have a full hour. We don't necessarily need to take it all, but... Uh, um, it's really up to you guys if you have questions and that kind of thing. So, Jenna, I'm just going to turn it over to you. Hopefully, everybody can see the screen. If you can't, uh, I mean, there's not a lot I can do about it at this point, but hopefully you can hear me as well. So let me know if there's any issues. And I'll try to do what I can do to, to help out. Um, all right, Jenna, take it away. Thank you, Doug, and good afternoon again. Thank you for joining us for the Great Lakes webinar. As Doug uh, mentioned, this is part of NOAA's regional webinar series for the fourth national climate assessment. So today's presentation focuses on content in the assessment relative to the Great Lakes region and our communities, building on the Midwest webinar that was last week. Um, as Doug mentioned, the webinar is being recorded and the recording will be available in a couple of days. And the URL to access the recording is gonna be on the last slide of the presentation. So we have two presenters today. Again, my name is Jenna Jorns, and I'm the program manager for the Great Lakes Integrated Sciences and Assessments, or GLISA. And we are a collaboration between the University of Michigan and Michigan State University, and are funded by NOAA. We are part of a national network of regional teams dedicated to helping the nation prepare for and adapt to climate variability and change. GLISA serves the eight Great Lakes states and the province of Ontario. And our main focus is to work with stakeholders in the Great Lakes to develop the best possible climate information to inform better decision making in our region. I'm joined by my colleague, Brent Lofgren, who will introduce himself. And Brent, you can go ahead and unmute yourself and introduce yourself. Okay, I'm sorry. Um, this is Brent Lofgren. I'm a physical scientist uh, with the NOAA Great Lakes Environmental Research Lab, and I uh, specialize in computer modeling of climate change-related uh, phenomena in the Great Lakes region. Great. Thank you, Brent. So an outline for today's presentation, we'll start with some background on the fourth National Climate Assessment, or NCA4, before moving on to how regions are defined in the assessment. Then we'll touch on highlights from volume one of the assessment of the Climate Science Special Report. Some of this was also covered in last week's webinar on the Midwest, but it provides good context for the rest of our presentation today. After that, we'll focus on volume two of the assessment, impact, risks, and adaptation in the United States, and give some examples of where and how the Great Lakes are featured in the report. And then we'll end with some ways that you can use the assessment and have time for questions. So to start, what is the NCA4 and how is it developed? So the U.S. Global Change Research Program, or USGCRP for short, was mandated by Congress in the Global Change Research Act of 1990 to assist the nation and the world to understand, assess, 
predict and respond to human-induced and natural process of global change. Through the US GCRP, agencies work to coordinate global change research across the government, use research results and products to provide information regarding risk management in a changing culture and climate, and inform and deliver products mandated every four years by the Global Change Research Act, and that includes the fourth national climate assessment. The overall process is led by a federal steering committee composed of representatives from 13 different agencies, and the NCA4 was written by more than 300 federal and non-federal authors. And the authors come from a diverse range of climate change-related expertise. Uh, the authors are volunteers coming from academia, nonprofits, the private sector, and state and federal agencies, just to name a few. For Volume 2, it was a two-year effort of writing and review. The report underwent six different rounds of expert review, including peer review by the National Academy of Sciences, Engineering, and Medicine, and multiple opportunities for public input and review. And we'll spend a minute on how that public engagement worked. So public feedback on the draft report really helped shape the overall content and direction of NCA4. And there was an open call for author nominations right at the beginning of the process to help ensure a range of expertise was included in the writing. Technical inputs were also solicited through a public call, giving individuals an opportunity to suggest relevant literature. Notably for our region, a series of regional engagement workshops in 2017 and a series of sector-specific webinars reached more than 1,000 stakeholders, ensuring more relevant and usable chapter content. And the map on this slide shows the distribution of those regional engagement workshops. And you'll see there were 11 in just the Great Lakes region alone. A call for review editors provided an important layer of external independent validation that authors responded to external comments. And finally, a three-month public comment period at the end of 2018, end of 2017, excuse me, and early 2018 provided a final opportunity for input into the report. The fourth National Climate Assessment has two distinct volumes. The first was released in 2017 and is called the Climate Science Special Report. And the second was released in late 20, 2018 and is called Impacts, Risks, and Adaptation in the United States. Uh, this table shows the three congressional mandates for the National Climate Assessment and how the two volumes meet them. So volume one focuses on providing the most up-to-date climate change science, analyzing trends in global change, and projecting future changes for the next 25 to 100 years. And Volume 2, instead, focuses on the observed impacts of climate change to a number of specific sectors. And both volumes address uncertainty. So to talk about the Great Lakes, we first need to understand how regions are defined in the assessment. So this map shows the 10 regions as defined in the fourth National Climate Assessment. Each region has a dedicated author team and a separate chapter in volume two of the report. And broadly speaking, the Midwest chapter is the most relevant to the Great Lakes region, but the Northeast region includes parts of the Lake Erie and Ontario basins in Pennsylvania and New York. And several of the national sector-specific chapters have content relevant to the lakes, and we'll cover all of that today. So now we'll get into the good stuff, starting with Volume 1 of the Climate Science Special Report. What do we know about climate change in the United States? So this slide shows the home website for Volume 1, and the URL for this page is at the bottom of the slide if you'd like to check it out more later. So the Climate Science Special Report is really the nuts and bolts of climate change science in the U United States and it has a lot of excellent graphics and maps. Today, we'll touch on some highlights from temperature, precipitation, and future projections from the volume one, but the full report has individual chapters on drought and wildfire, sea level rise, ocean acidification, land cover, Arctic changes, and mitigation. So I encourage you to check those out if you're interested in those individual topics. 
So overall, the Climate Science Special Report finds that the last few years have seen record-breaking climate-related weather extremes, and the last three years have been the warmest years on record for the globe. And these trends are expected to continue into the future. The assessment concludes, based on extensive evidence, that it is extremely likely that human activities, especially emissions of greenhouse gases, are the dominant cause of this observed warming since the mid-20th century. And for the warming over the last century, there is no convincing alternative explanation supported by the extent of the observational evidence. So volume one is primarily national and focused, but many figures have regional relevance for the Great Lakes. We'll spend the next few slides on observed temperature, future projections, and then precipitation and extreme events. So here we have two figures from chapter one of volume one. On the left, we see the anomaly, or the change from the average of global land and ocean temperatures from 1880 to present. Red bars show above average temperatures and blue are below average. So since the 1940s, we've been in the red and we see a steady march upwards starting in the 70s and continuing to today. This shows global average annual temperature has already increased by more than 1.2 degrees Fahrenheit during this time. And this is like nothing we've seen in the historical record. On the right, we see observed surface temperature change on a map of the globe from 1986 to 2016 relative to 1901 to 1960. And in this map, darker reds indicate more warming. And here we truly see a global warming with increases across the globe, although the extent of that warming varies widely by region. So this next figure is from chapter two, and this shows three different types of radiative forcing from 1950 to 2011. So radiative forcing is a measure of the influence of a factor, such as greenhouse gas emissions, on, has in changing the global balance of incoming and outgoing energy. So radiative forcings greater than zero, or positive forcings, produce warming. Forcings less than zero, or negative forcings, produce climate cooling. So here we see global annual average radiative forcing from 1950 to 2011 due to human activities, solar irradiance, and volcanic emissions. And black bars indicate the uncertainty in each. The large positive red bar shows the likely range of the human contribution to the global mean temperature increase over this period. And it shows it's from 1.1 to 1.4 degrees Fahrenheit. Radiative forcing due to volcanic emissions is always negative and leads to cooling and can be very large immediately following an eruption, but it's very short-lived. There are also natural variations in temperature and other climate variables, which operate on annual to decadal timescales. This natural variability contributes very little to climate trends over decades and longer timescales. So here we have two figures from chapter four, and these show projections for the future. On the left, we can see observed emissions to present day and a range of projected annual global carbon emissions to year 2100. So projections of future climate conditions use a range of plausible future scenarios. And the colors of each of these lines represent these different possible future scenarios from low to moderate to high emissions. Consistent with previous practice, the fourth national climate assessment relies on scenarios generated for the Intergovernmental Panel on Climate Change, or IPCC. The IPCC completed its last assessment in 2013 and 2014, and its projections were based on updated scenarios, and those are called Representative Concentration Pathways, or RCPs. And these RCP scenarios are numbered according to the changes in radiative forcing in year 2100 relative to pre-industrial conditions. So those are the different RCP numbers you can see on the graph on the left. So these figures don't predict one future, but rather a range of possible futures. And on the right, we can see the historical observed and then future projected temperature change 
that would result for those range of possible future emission scenarios seen in the figure on the left. And taken together, these two figures show that global climate is projected to continue to change over the century and beyond. And the magnitude of climate change beyond the next few decades will depend primarily on the amount of greenhouse gases that are emitted globally. And even if we see greenhouse gas concentrations stabilize at their current level and decrease rapidly, as seen in the low or green scenario, existing concentrations would commit the world to at least an additional one degree of warming over this century relative to the last few decades. So here we're looking at temperature again, but here we're zooming in on the United States. And this is for observed changes only. So as we saw in the earlier global temperature map, uh, darker reds indicate more warming. You can see darker red uh, in the northern and western parts of the United States, and in particular in the upper Great Lakes in northern Minnesota, Wisconsin, Michigan, and New York. And when looking at the observed changes by season in the lower two maps, we can see the temperature increase in the Great Lakes region, and in much of the US, it's seen more so in the winter than in the summer. And the projections show the temperatures will continue to increase under all emission scenarios. And finally, we have a slide on heavy precipitation from Chapter 7 of Volume 1. The assessment finds that average annual precipitation has already increased since 1901 in the United States. But this increase is very different across the seasons and the regions of the US. So much of this increase in precipitation is coming in the form of extreme events. The assessment finds with high confidence that heavy precipitation events in most of the United States have increased in both intensity and frequency since 1901. There are important regional differences in this trend with the largest increases occurring in the Midwest and Northeastern United States. So the map on this slide shows the observed change in heavy precipitation events from 1958 to 2016. And this map shows the 99th percentile of events, so the heaviest of the heavy rain events. And the black numbers are the percent increase during this time period. So we see a 42% increase in the Midwest and a 55% increase for the Northeast. And this increase, as we'll discuss later, is a big concern for communities that are worried about flooding many of which are already dealing with aging infrastructure. And for precipitation, the projections show medium confidence that average precipitation will increase, but high confidence that the frequency and intensity of extreme events are very likely to continue to increase in the future. OK, so now we'll move on to volume two. So what impacts have already been observed in the Great Lakes region? What are the risks, and how are we adapting already? So where Volume 1 focused on the science, Volume 2 focuses on impacts to people and places. It covers already observed changes and impacts, potential future risks, and examples of adaptation strategies. So it aims to assess a range of potential impacts to help decision makers better identify risks that could be avoided or reduced. In this way, it is policy relevant, but not policy prescriptive. It also uses case studies to provide additional context and opportunities to showcase community success stories. Volume two has 29 chapters and five appendices all listed here. The first set of chapters are national topic chapters, and the second are regional chapters. And it's important to note that in the fourth assessment, much more space in terms of number of pages is given to the regional chapters. And this was in response to the very large interest in the regional chapters in the third national climate assessment. And the chapters with green boxes around them on the slide indicate chapters that mention and discuss the Great Lakes themselves. And so here I'll go through uh, the national topic chapters and what they say about the Great Lakes. In the water chapter, we learn how the International Joint Commission adopted a new operating plan for Great Lakes water levels. 
And this is discussed as an example of how to plan for a future that will be different from the past. The economic importance of the Great Lakes is highlighted in the Coastal Effects chapter, emphasizing how critical the economy is to our country. In the Agriculture chapter, the assessment explains how nutrient overloading leads to eutrophication and harmful algal blooms in the United States and coastal water bodies, threatening water quality. In transportation, we see how increasing precipitation and resultant flooding affects boat traffic in the Great Lakes, impacting jobs and the ability of goods to get to domestic and international markets. In the chapter on U.S. international interests, we learn about the Great Lakes Water Quality Agreement and how Canada and the United States are already working together to identify, quantify, understand, and predict the impacts of climate change on Great Lakes water quality. And this is used as an example of binational cooperation to address climate change. The Ecosystems, Agriculture, Built Environment, and Sector Interactions chapters I'll refer to a case study in the Midwest chapter on the Great Lakes Climate Adaptation Network. And we'll talk about this case study in detail when we talk about the Midwest chapter and key message sticks. So we'll spend the rest of the webinar on the Midwest chapter. Like all the other chapters in the assessment, the Midwest chapter is organized around several key messages. And there are six for the Midwest region. And these are agriculture, forests, ecosystems and biodiversity, human health, transportation and infrastructure, and community vulnerability and adaptation. Today we're going to focus on key messages 3, 4, and 6. If you're interested in agriculture, forests, and human health, I encourage you to check out the recording of last week's Midwest webinar that goes into a lot more detail on these topics. So here, I'll turn it over to Brent to talk about Key Message 3, and a special longer case study on Great Lakes included in part of this key message. So Brent, you can take it away. All right, I think I'll leave you in control of the slides, though, and uh, start presenting <clears throat> on these key messages. So key message number three is biodiversity and ecosystems. And in the full report, there's, there's a whole lot of text about this. But um, ecosystems are one of the key areas of, of uh, climate sensitivity. And ecosystems basically have adapted to a certain range of climate that uh, they are accustomed to. And uh, any changes in climate are likely to upset that, that uh, system. Uh, so let's go on to the next slide. Yeah, this, this is a, uh, an introduction to some of the key features of the Great Lakes and uh, uh, we often tell people that uh, the Great Lakes contain 20% of the world's surface fresh water and a large population of people uh, in two different countries and allow for uh, commercial fishing, recreational activities, and uh, shipping. Uh, a number of economic sectors are dependent on the Great Lakes. So changes in the Great Lakes that uh, result from climate change can be economically important and uh, can affect the way that people view their environment. Next slide. Uh, this slide goes over a particular uh, scientific study on the effects of changes in lake temperature in inland lakes so these are generally uh, shallower than the Great Lakes and uh, are, are smaller in overall size. And uh, essentially, it's the, the headline here is cold water fish at risk. So fish that prefer to be in cold water will um, 
have have a more difficult time reproducing, growing, and thriving in some of these inland lakes. However, I participated in another study with uh, some colleagues from the U.S. Geological Survey, and uh, the findings there in the Great Lakes, where there's a much greater depth, is that uh, fish can adapt by finding the proper depth where their preferred water temperature is located, and um, barring problems with food availability, they actually tend to grow faster. Uh, however, that particular study did not answer the question of whether there is sufficient availability of food. So these end up being complicated questions with many facets. And um, a, a lot of these questions of impacts of climate change really have a larger amount of uncertainty to them than the overall question of whether climate change is happening and whether humans are causing it. Next slide. Uh, these, these are just a few of the examples of phenomenology for the Great Lakes. And on the left, we're showing the uh, trend in duration of ice cover. Uh, so the duration of ice cover on the Great Lakes has been trending downward over time. However, it, it uh, has a large amount of variability. So Jenna several times mentioned Natural variability is one of the things that's also happening at the same time as climate uh, climate change in a warming direction. Um, so uh, those are always different facets of the climate system. Uh, and then on the right, it's showing summer surface water temperature, and that is uh, trending upward. Next slide, please. Now this is showing results that are based on a regional model of climate in the Great Lakes region. And it's, uh, it's using first as a basis some of these global simulations of climate change. And um, then uh, nesting into that a finer gridded climate simulation. So we call this either regional climate modeling or dynamical downscaling of climate. And what is being shown here is the, uh, the temperatures of a water column in Lake Superior as simulated by this model. Uh, and all of the temperatures on those color bars are in degrees Celsius. So um, one of the key thresholds of temperature in freshwater is four degrees Celsius or 39 degrees Fahrenheit. And that is the temperature of maximum density of fresh water. And uh, historically, each of the Great Lakes has passed through that threshold twice a year, once as the temperature is warming and once as it's cooling in the late fall. So the uh, the figures here are showing the, uh, the vertical dimension is depth within the lake, and the horizontal dimension is in units of days, that's uh, days of the year. And during historical times, there's, there's been a uh, roughly three or four month period in Lake Superior at which the uh, temperatures near the surface are below that four degrees Celsius threshold. And then another period during the summer where they are warmer than that. And um, because that water of lesser density is at the surface, it's, it's a stable configuration of the water and there's not a whole lot of mixing that goes down to greater depth. On the right, <clears throat> it's labeled as superior <clears throat> R85, and that is referring back to what Jenna was talking about with the, with the representative concentration pathways. So this one is uh, uh, 
that's an abbreviation for RCP 8.5, which is the highest uh, concentration scenario that's, that's used in those RCP scenarios. Uh, and this is for the late 21st century. And it's showing that there's uh, really only a short period when Lake Superior has surface temperatures below four degrees Celsius. And then there's a, um, an onset of temperatures above that threshold. And it quickly sets up to have a very strong vertical temperature gradient, which means that the, the uh, water column is highly stable and not much of that heat from the surface ends up mixing downward. Um, another facet of the vertical mixing that occurs, has historically occurred twice a year, is that uh, it mixes nutrients upward from the sediment and it mixes oxygen downward from the uh, surface and that spurs growth of uh, of biological activity. Uh, and the, the duration between those mixing times is, is also important. It can, uh, it can end up uh, depriving some of that life of the needed nutrients. So uh, did we go backwards as a slide here? Let's, let's go forward one more now. Okay, uh, a few little points about water levels and ice cover. Uh, increases in water temperature are occurring in all seasons and ice cover is, expect, uh, is expected to undergo continued reductions. Um, this particular ice season that's about to end kind of took us by surprise. Uh, there's been more ice this year than was expected but uh, in the long run, we expect less ice cover. Um, one, one result that has become kind of more prominent and uh, more strongly trusted in, in the fourth national climate assessment is the, the reduced impact on water levels compared to what was uh, what was expected when people were looking at this a decade ago or so. Um, there, there were some problems with methodologies that were used for quite a while, and the drops in lake levels that were previously expected are, have, have been shown to be exaggerated. So the uh, central tendency of what we find is uh, uh, the numbers here are really most valid for Lakes Michigan and Huron. So the most likely change in water level is a drop of about 10 centimeters or four inches by the late 21st century. But there is a significant spread of uncertainty and there is a possibility of, uh, of rises in lake levels in the long run. And once again, all of these results are overlaid by natural variability. So the water levels have fluctuated over decadal time scales in the past, and that is going to continue into the future. Next slide. Okay. Uh, thank you, Brent. I think I'm picking it up from here. All right. So the last part of the focus of the Great Lakes talks about coastal communities. And coastal communities and several economic sectors, as Brent just mentioned, so shipping, transportation, and tourism, are vulnerable to climate impacts, as discussed in the National Coastal Effects chapter. So Brent just discussed uh, the uncertainty in future lake levels. But earlier research showed that scenarios of decreasing lake levels will increase shipping costs, even if the shipping season is longer and that lower ice cover could increase the damage to coastal infrastructure caused by winter storms. So while some coastal communities in the region have expressed willingness to integrate climate action into planning efforts, 
it's hard to get access to useful climate information and to find the time and resources to work on these issues. And this has been demonstrated in projects, for instance, with marinas and harbors in Michigan, and with ravine management in Illinois and Wisconsin, and with the Chicago Climate Action Plan. The picture on this slide is from a shared ravine in Lake Bluff, Illinois, where the Alliance for the Great Lakes worked with climate scientists at Lisa and ravine managers to manage erosion. So Lake Michigan's western shore in Wisconsin and northern Illinois holds more than 50 small watersheds, and these are known locally as ravines. Stormwater runoff subjects these ravines to serious erosion, threatening property and infrastructure. So the Great Lakes, the Great Lakes Alliance has produced guides to reduce erosion through best management practices, including stream buffers, the use of native plants for stabilization, and reducing the steepness or gradient of the stream banks. So the chapter finds that many more communities may benefit from using their existing stakeholder networks and building upon lessons learned from leaders in the region. So moving on to key message five on transportation and infrastructure. We saw earlier how overall precipitation is increasing, and in the Great Lakes, we've already seen a large increase in extreme precipitation events. So this key message goes into detail into how stormwater management systems, transportation networks, and other critical infrastructure are already experiencing impacts from changing precipitation patterns and elevated flood risks. Runoff from extreme events can exceed the capacity of some stormwater systems resulting in property damage, including basement backups. And in some areas with older sewer systems that combine sanitary sewage with stormwater, extreme rain can result in the release of raw sewage into rivers and streams, posing both health and ecological risks. These releases are known as combined sewer overflows, or CSOs. And these pose challenges to major sources of drinking water, including the Mississippi River and the Great Lakes. But green infrastructure is reducing some of the negative impacts of these events by using plants and open space to absorb stormwater. And the chapter gives example adaptation strategies from Cermak Island in Chicago, St. Louis, Minneapolis, and Cleveland. And here we have a figure from Cleveland's city tree plan. The city of Cleveland is prioritizing tree planting as an adaptation strategy with an emphasis on increasing tree canopy in low-income neighborhoods. And in addition to its stormwater management benefits, urban forestry also reduces the urban heat island effect and acts as a carbon sink to absorb greenhouse gases. And the EPA in a recent report estimates that the annual cost of adapting urban stormwater management systems to more frequent and severe events is projected to exceed 500 million in the Midwest alone by the end of the century. So key message six was a new topic for the Midwest chapter compared to the third uh, national assessment, and it focuses on vulnerable communities. Overall, the key message finds that at-risk communities in the Midwest are becoming more vulnerable to climate change impacts, such as flooding, drought, and increases in urban heat islands. The most at-risk communities to climate change in the Midwest are cities, rural communities, coastal communities, and tribes. And depending on the climate impact, the vulnerability of these groups is compounded by existing stressors. So in cities, for example, these stressors can include economic downturn, deteriorating infrastructure, and shrinking populations. Rural communities, for instance, may be more affected due to lack of access to emergency response or to resources to adapt to climate change at the local level or from more occupational exposure to high heat and tribes and indigenous communities are one of the most vulnerable populations since climate change impacts their culture, sovereignty, health, economies, and way of life. And there's a number of great examples of tribes and indigenous community adaptation in the chapter. Work on estimating the cost of adaptation nationally and in the Midwest remains limited, but a recent EPA report that I just referenced estimated that the Midwest is among the regions with the largest expected damages to infrastructure, including the highest estimated damages to roads, rising from $3.3 billion per year in 2050 to $6 billion per year in 2090 under a high emission scenario. 
and the Midwest has the highest number of vulnerable bridges of all regions in the United States. However, the chapter also finds that the Midwest may actually experience some migration of people into the region because of climate change. And this comes from research that values climate amenities, so how much it costs to live in a certain location due to warmer winters and hotter summers in a future climate change. So because this is a very long-term prospect, maybe this finding will urge communities to start thinking about how to adapt to this now. How can we prepare for people moving into the region? So at the local level, municipal and tribal governments are usually the entities responsible for making adaptation policies and decisions, and then funding and implementing them. In some, but not all, cities in the Midwest do have municipal staff responsible for this type of work. However, the documented implementation of climate adaptation remains low in the Great Lakes. And this is because cities are often constrained by a lack of political and financial support to take action. They also may not have access to credible and trustworthy climate information to know what changes to plan for. So the chapter finds that communities face a lot of barriers to plan for climate change at the local level. But many cities in the Great Lakes are trying to work together and learn more from each other's successes and challenges. And one such group is the Great Lakes Climate Adaptation Network, or GLECAN. And there's a case study in Key Message 6 about a project this group worked on together to develop a vulnerability assessment template. And the example describes how practitioners in cities are working together with researchers at universities to use the best available climate information in their existing planning processes. So here, five Great Lakes cities partnered with the Great Lakes Integrated Sciences and Assessment, the Huron River Watershed Council, and Headwaters Economics to develop a, uni a universal vulnerability assessment template. And the template is meant to integrate climate and equity information into all types of city planning. And this figure shows how climate information and knowledge moved across collaborating organizations in this example. So from scientists to the network to decision makers in the cities. The vulnerability assessment tool was first developed for five cities and has now been expanded to 18 cities in the Midwest and Mid-Atlantic with additional funding from the Urban Sustainability Directors Network. And now with even more funding from NOAA, it's being implemented for stormwater management in 12 cities in the Great Lakes. So continuing support for these types of collaborations and scaling up existing successful tools will be critical to help communities in the Great Lakes prepare for the future. OK, so we are very close to the end. So to summarize, the National Climate Assessment shows that the impacts of climate change already are and will continue to be deep and widespread in the Great Lakes. Climate change will only further exacerbate the vulnerability of ecosystems and human populations already under stress in the Great Lakes. And while some adaptation and mitigation efforts have begun, much more is needed. So to end, uh, how can you use the assessment? So on this slide, we have the home page of uh, the Volume 2 website. And the URL for this page is going to be on the next and final slide. Overall, I think the website is very user friendly. And you can click uh, directly on this home page for direct access to summary findings, an overview, or individual chapters. And the screenshot here hovers over the drop-down menu that appears if you click on Download. You can easily download any figure, chapter, and even pre-made presentations on each chapter or the entire report. And in past assessments, uh, figures and maps like the ones you can download here have been widely used in education and schools communities and public outreach. You can also here order hard copies of the overview or report in brief for free. The report in brief is also available in Spanish, and summary findings are available in Mandarin. And at the bottom of the slide is the link to sign up for the USGCRP newsletter for regular updates on this and future assessments. They only email you every other month. And if you'd like to get even more involved, please let me know and I can put you in touch with the right people. 
And finally, a recording of today's webinar will be available at this URL in a couple of days. You can also find the recording of the earlier Midwest webinar here if you're interested in the other key messages on the Midwest chapter. And that's all we have for today. Thank you very much for joining us, and we're happy to take questions. Thank you, Jenna and Brent. That was um, nice and complete. Lots of information to share there. I want to reiterate that uh, the Global Change websites are, are very useful, especially if, you, if you're trying to pass along information. There are canned uh, presentations for each chapter. There isn't one specifically, as uh, Jenna mentioned, for the Great Lakes. Um, but we will put this recording up on the webinar or that site on the bottom there for anyone you'd like to share it with for any educational purposes or 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 capacity building. Uh, at the moment, I don't have any questions uh, that anybody's asked during the presentation. I'm just wondering if anybody has a comment or a question right now. Go ahead and raise your hand or type something in there. I can unmute you if you'd like to say something. Okay, looks like people are leaving. So uh, I don't think there are any uh, any um, hard and fast questions that people have. Uh, it looks like they got the information that they were hoping for. And uh, I guess we will stop the recording. Uh, any final comments from you, Jenna or uh, Brent? Uh, no, uh, thank you very much for having us. Yeah. No, thanks. And, uh, thanks, Doug and Jenna. You bet. We'll do this again in four years. <laughs> Maybe we'll have an actual Great Lakes chapter by then. So thank you very much, and uh, talk to you again. Bye-bye. All right, bye.